Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, the nation's 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, is honored by this living memorial. And unlike some other presidential memorials that you may have visited during your time here in Washington, uh, this is more than marble and statues and quotes. People, real people, do work here, and they provide deep research on a range of important topics, both uh, in the United States and around the world with the hope that they can help inform the public policy debate and we're thrilled to have you as part of that equation today. My name is John Molesky. My full-time job here is I'm the producer and host of our weekly TV and radio program Dialogue at the Wilson Center which airs every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. on the MHZ networks. Uh, but today we're here to have a discussion with uh, an author, Akbar Ahmed, and his, about his new book The Thistle and the, Dr and the Drone, How America's War on Terror Became a Global War on tribal Islam. Very interesting topic that I'm sure you're going to have some questions about. Let me tell you a bit about Akbar and then we will uh, find out a bit about you so that our guests can know who he's talking to as well. Akbar Ahmed is the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University. He's also the first distinguished chair of Middle East Studies at the U.S. Naval Academy and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. That's a lot to do, and in his spare time, he writes books. Uh, his previous books include Journey into Islam, The Crisis of Globalization, Journey into America, The Challenge of Islam. This is the third in that trilogy. Akbar Ahmed, welcome to the Wilson Center. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Uh, now, before I ask you about the book and uh, about yourself a bit, I want to introduce Tim Hare, who is one of the people working with this particular group of students, and Tim will tell you a little bit about who you're going to be meeting today. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, doctor, we have 15 students participating on the ACEMILE program. Those are students from Serbia and Montenegro. And we have 100 students partic participating from the uh, Senator Kennedy, Senator Luger, YES program. Uh, these are participants are from significantly Muslim countries, and this is the 10th year anniversary of that particular program. About 900 of these students were in the country. Um, they applied to come to Washington for the Civic Education Workshop, and these are the 115 winners. Great, happy 10th anniversary. Tim, you may remember uh, Dr. Ahmed and I and Rabbi Lustig and- uh, I do. Uh, we're at the National Cathedral with a previous group of students from this program. We had a fantastic interfaith dialogue uh, yes, there and it was a great a session. A remarkable event, yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank we look you, forward to hearing from you in a moment. You. Uh, Akbar, I thought it would be interesting before we dive into the book to just provide a little bit of your own personal biographical background that I think the students will find interesting. Uh, you're a, a, a child of Pakistan. Yes, uh, John. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me, John. I'm, I'm delighted to be with these uh, students. As a professor on campus, I look out at the sea of faces, uh, exactly as I do on my campus. And I'm really encouraged because this is the future. And they are going to decide which way the century is going, up, down, or whatever, and we, we pray that they succeed. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be with them, to sense their passion and their energy. Uh, my own journey for this uh, particular project uh, began on 9-11. On that dreadful day, I was in class, again, talking to students like you, uh, when the events took place uh, in New York and Washington. The Pentagon is just a few miles from my class, so you can imagine the impact on my class on me. Now, I had come to American University literally a few weeks before. And I had come after a very long and a varied career. I'd been ambassador. I'd been in charge of the tribal areas in Pakistan. I'd been commissioner in Balochistan. I spent many years in Cambridge. And I thought, I'm here on campus. I'm semi-retired. I write my books, give the odd uh, lecture and seminar, and really lead a very peaceful, comfortable, obscure life. Within a few weeks, of course, my life changed because uh, people wanted to know about Islam, my subject, my religion, my own background. And I felt that this was a moment when I, as an individual in America, as a newcomer, new immigrant, could give back to this country, which had been so incredibly generous and warm and welcoming to me and my family. So since that time, it's been a non-stop effort to try to create better understanding between the U.S. and the rest of the world in, with a focus on the Muslim world. In that pursuit, John, as you know, we've uh, together had a play on stage. Uh, I undertook my first big journey, journey into Islam with my American University students. My second big journey, journey into America. And this book is the third part of the trilogy. This is looking at the interstices. The interstices, as you know, your bright young students, means that part between two different spaces. So it's that little space 
which often gets left out. These are the areas on the borders of countries, undefined, ambiguous, and almost every country has a problem between the center of the government, the central government in that country, and the periphery, the border areas. So this is where I have focused for this book, and this is, uh, the, the result is with you, John, and we have 40 case studies looking at uh, these different societies. And again, the, these youngsters are going to go back, they'll join politics, they'll be journalists, they'll be leaders. They need to know about their countries, the problems they're going to be facing, and how to relate those problems with the rest of the world. We're living in the age of globalization. Nothing is isolated. You cannot live as an island. No person can live as an island. No country can live as an island. So that, I think, will be the great opportunity for you and challenge. I want to ask you about the title. Uh, the drone part is easy to understand. Uh, tell us about the thistle as well and what you chose that to represent. Well, the title is the thistle and the drone. The thistle, as you know, is this prickly flower. Does anyone know what a thistle is? What the flower looks like? It's a very prickly flower. It doesn't Almost smell. Almost like a cactus. It's like a cactus. It doesn't smell like the rose. It doesn't have soft petals. And it's a, rep it's a symbol of Scotland. Scotland, as you know, is a society which has great pride, takes great pride in its traditions, in its cultures, in its history, as a tribal people with clans and codes of honor. And to them, the thistle represents the tribe, tribal identity. And many of the tribes that I'm studying, like the Pukhtun, the Pathan tribes of North Pakistan and Eastern Afghanistan, or in the Yemen, or in Somalia, or the Kurds, also see themselves as tribal people with similar char characteristics. And I thought if we took one symbol of these societies, it would be the thistle, because many writers have used this symbol to describe these tribal societies. The drone symbolizes a different kind of society. It is the ultimate advanced kill mach machine, kill technology of globalization. So you can see how two different kinds of societies, one centuries old, one 21st century, are in conflict and colliding in our world. And once again, we have to come and discover ways of solving this conflict because this conflict is creating unhappiness, misery, death, and destruction all across the world. Many, many societies are being literally fragmented and destroyed. So these are the big issues that we've explored in this book. Now, now we're told that drone technology is something that allows for surgical strikes, on, on high value targets, as the military likes to call them, uh, in a more simplistic uh, uh, paradigm, bad guys, terrorists or would-be terrorists. But you're saying that instead of accomplishing that, that essentially the use of drones is declaring war on tribal cultures. It is, John, in, a, in, in some, because in theory, the idea that a drone can come in like a surgeon when a patient is on the operating theater and just literally cut out the, the uh, ill parts, the parts that have to be excised. But in reality, when there's a society, it's very difficult to kill the husband without killing the wife and the kids or the neighbors, mm -hmm. and to even know whether the husband's guilty in the first place or not. What processes allowed us to decide that this man should be assassinated or killed or not? Uh, besides, remember that the drone is flying overhead all the time. And we have interviews of people in Waziristan, in Pakistan, where children, young people like you, your age, 18, 19, 20, cannot go to sleep. They just can't sleep out of sheer terror because all the time they're hearing these drones. And they're asking in their minds, is it going to be me next or my neighbor or my uncle or my cousin? And this is happening, a wedding party, a funeral party. So I would say, John, that if 5 or 10 or 15 percent of the bad guys, however we conclude they are the bad guys, are taken out, 90, 80 percent of the good guys are also taken out. And the end result is that entire societies are now traumatized. Waziristan, you have the drones one day, army action the next, inter-rivalry between tribes the next, suicide bombers killing them the next. And the result is that that society is living on the edge of complete fear, uncertainty, despair, anger. And as a result, you're seeing so many of these terrible suicide bombers blowing up schools, blowing up buses, 
walking into gatherings like this, blowing up people. And this has to stop because who is suffering again are the women and the children and the young. The future is being affected. Now, I have the advantage of uh, having known you for many years and uh, know your work, know you personally. And so I, I see this theme that has continued through your work and come into laser-like focus with this book of uh, straddling worlds or, or competing priorities or duality. I'm not sure how I, I would describe it, but I'll let you describe it. Talk about how this focus, how this concept has come into focus for you. John, it's been, you're absolutely right that it is straddling because, you know, I'm also looking at this book and I was very fortunate to have this wonderful team of young uh, American researchers and students and assistants working with me. Uh, they, together we're able to give you a very multi-dimensional view of what's going on because the debate has just started in the United States. I mean, you should know this, you guys, uh, the young students, the debate about drones just started. And other countries are very soon going to get this and use it. Well, the debate is very one-sided. A debate really means two opposing ideas in exchange, in conflict. In this case, it's a very one-sided debate because we don't hear the other side. So what we try to do is provide the other side by interviewing people on the ground. And when you put that together, then you have this notion of straddling. And I hope then that we are able to present a very comprehensive, complex picture of the reality on the ground allowing us then to say, okay, then this is an alternative way of bringing some stability, security, and peace in the region. Because ultimately, ultimately, every society has to function on the basis of security, stability, and compassion. That's a very important word. So that's one word and one thread, as it were, John, that carries right through the book. You begin uh, the book in, in Waziristan, which has been called the most dangerous place in the world. What does Waziristan tell us about, not just Waziristan, that's particular to that region, but about this, this duality, these tribal cultures, these areas of the world? Waziristan tells us a lot, John. Waziristan is one of the most romantic, isolated uh, places on earth. How many of you have heard of Waziristan before we began this? Discussion? Oh, a lot of people, yes. And these are not just Pakistanis, right? No. no. Non-Pakistanis? No. You're from? What do you hear of Waziristan? Well, you know, come to the microphone and tell us that, if you would. And don't say anything bad, by the way. I was there for a long time. I have lots of friends. <laughs> um, I you don't. Know, yeah, we just so people didn't, who we didn't hear you off mic, you're from Lebanon, but you raised your hand that you were familiar with Waziristan. Yeah, I've heard of Waziristan for being um, a dangerous place full of uh, terrorists and uh, and every, every week, uh, to, I mean, a lot of people die there, and um, yeah, that's typically good. it. Good, that's good. Now, it's good because he's giving us a very fair assessment of what people think of Waziristan. And here's the tragedy. I know Waziristan, I've served there. I lived there for many years amongst those tribes. I know the terrain, I know the people. Now, you know, they're like you and me. They're ordinary people, they want to get on with their lives. When Pakistan was created in 1947, these areas had no hospital, no school, no education, no roads. So it was the duty of Pakistan to give them these facilities and bring them into modern civilization. That did not happen. What they did had, have was their own pride in their own culture, their own customs. Uh, they were a peaceful people. There was respect for elders, traditional leadership. There was respect for the religious elders. And there was respect for the representatives of central government. And these three forces balanced each other. Now, what's happened recently in the last decade or two is the new elements in society which have emerged, emerged. And these are what you call the suicide bombers or the terrorists. And their aim is to destroy the traditional patterns of society. So they're destroying the elders. They've killed something like 400 elders of Waziristan. Now this is a tribal society. You kill the head and you kill 400 of the elders John is decapitating a society. Now when that happens, you think of the ordinary person in Waziristan, your age in Waziristan, and they're a very clever, intelligent people. Think what they're going through. They're saying, how are we even able to exist in this society? Half of Waziristan is now migrated, they've run away, looking for shelter in Karachi or Lahore or Peshawar. So we have to ask ourselves, why is a society being destroyed in pursuit of five or 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 bad guys? 
That's the question we have to answer. Because what you cannot do is punish an entire people on the basis of a hundred people who may or may not be bad or may or may not be wanted. That's the question. The moral dimension, and that moral dimension is so far missing in the debate. Give us some detail on the, the, what life is like in these regions for these, these tribal people you speak of. In other words, you know, how primitive versus modern are their lifestyles? You know, John, again, on one level we could call them primitive in the sense they don't have these access to these facilities I talked about, even fairly recently. But on the other hand, let me tell you that these very people, and they belong to the Pakhtun, larger Pakhtun tribal uh, groups, they have contributed at every level of society. Do you know there was a president of India who was a Pakhtun? There's someone from India here, from Absolutely. India. Who was the president of India who was a Pathan? So you don't know, Priyanka, tell them. <laughs> Priyanka, you ruined my reputation. Asia, you tell them. Zakir Hussain. Zakir Hussain, well done. Zakir Hussain, president I'm of India. I'm keeping score by those of you who got the answer wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble. Zakir Hussain, now this is for the Indian group. Pathan, president of India. One of the top stars in India, Shah Rukh Khan. Pathan. The cricket captain of India, Pataudi. Pathan. Cricket captain of Pakistan, Imran Khan. President of Pakistan. So these people, Ghaffar Khan, the great frontier Gandhi, these people have contributed at every level of society. So I would say, John, give them a chance to be able to contribute, rather than pound them into the ground and create more and more and more violence. And, wh and what your examples describe is people don't necessarily stay within their tribal communities from no, birth no, to no, death. No. Yeah. They move on into other Yeah, and then the, well. the examples I'm giving you, these people have come down in families. Uh, my own mother's uh, family came, the Barakzai Pathans. My mother's father was Sahashmatullah Khan, very distinguished person, uh, a long time back. But these are families that come down, they serve in other places, they thrive, they flourish, and they contribute. So we have to live as integrated societies, learn to respect people who are not like us, who have different languages, a different culture, and really learn to have compassion for each other. You, you use the story of three men uh, to describe this balancing act or this tension, and I'd like to go through them in, in order. The first is Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. and you talk about his uh, need to balance tribal and Islamic identities. Could you explain that? What is the, the conflict between these two identities? Now, we have a great uh, host here. He's not only a great TV host, he's a great intellectual. So he's, asked a, very, <laughs> he's asked a very sharp question, so please now follow me and no sleeping. Number one, Osama's dilemma. What is Osama's dilemma? Osama bin Laden. Anyone from Yemen? Are you, do you know Asir? The Asir tribes in South, South, Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Now, what is Osama's dilemma? He is a, what is his background? He's originally from Yemen. Yemen. Originally from, I'm going to just say this in case people who are watching us on TV can't hear because you're not on a microphone. But. So originally from Yemen, right? He has a tribal background, but he grows up in Saudi Arabia, he's abroad, he comes to America, he's Sudan, all over the place. Is there something you want to say? Yeah. I'll Come on on down to the microphone. Let's just improvise here. We're not, we're, right. just, we'll take the time, for travel time, since <laughs> your comments will be shared with a larger audience if you're at the microphone. And tell us where you are from. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Ahmed, I'm from Saudi Arabia, and from Asir, exactly what you were asking. You're from Asir? Yes. And are you uh, a Siri? Uh, no, but my tribe, is there. my tribe is there. Your tribe is? It's there, in Asir. In, in Asir? Mm -hmm. Are you a Qatani? Uh, no, I'm Shahrani. But Shahrani also a Siri tribe? Yeah. Yes, good. What's your name? My name is Ahmed. Ahmed, Ahmed Shahrani. Yes. I'm Akbar Ahmed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Do you think they know each other? No, no, no relationship, and none to the 19th hijacker. <laughs> They'll get us in trouble, John. So, so let me explain this. Now, Osama bin Laden's dilemma is the dilemma of all tribal people. Now, please follow me here. Tribal people are tribal, but they've also become Muslim, like the Yemenis. The Yamanis are the oldest Muslims. They became Muslims in the time of the Prophet of Islam, in the seventh century. And they're very proud Muslims. They go back to the roots of Islam. So they very much feel that they are the champions of Islam, as do many other tribes, as do the Pathans, 
as do the Kurds. So the dilemma of Osama bin Laden is how much of tribal identity should influence him or how much should Islamic identity influence him. Islam would tell him that if there's a problem, he needs to apply compassion. Even, even when he's angry, compassion trumps anger. Compassion trumps even the need to take revenge. But tribal identity demands the code of revenge. An eye for an eye. Someone does something, you must do something back. And that's his dilemma, how to balance this. And I found it fascinating as we uh, researched him for this book that we read everything he'd been saying. And John, you can see the dilemma. He's constantly saying, uh, well, you see, uh, all right, in one interview he says uh, on Al Jazeera, uh, yes, of course, the Prophet said not to kill women and children, etc., etc. But, and the moment he said but, you know, in faith, in religion, you cannot have ifs and buts. God says, especially our God, the Abrahamic God, he says, thou shalt do this. Yeah, there's a, a notion of but as an acronym that stands for behold the underlying truth. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but. <laughs> so, so here we have the dilemma of Osama bin Laden. The second dilemma is Musharraf's dilemma. Musharraf is the president of Pakistan. He must balance. And I, and I, I should add, just so they understand your, your rich background, a former boss of yours when yes, you were yes. ambassador. I was Ahmed. high commissioner from Pakistan. Now, his dilemma is, how do you balance the writ of the state, that is the authority of the central government, and the needs of the periphery? How do you balance these two as head of state, not as a tribesman, but as head of state? That's the second level of analysis. So first level is tribal, second level is national. The third level is President Obama as President of the United States. How do you balance the need for security. How do you keep the citizens of the United States secure? After all, in 9-11, uh, the United States has been hit. S several thousand people, th 3,000 people are dead, innocent people. Now you need to protect the United States to make sure it doesn't happen again. And how do you balance, on the other hand, opposed to this, how do you balance the needs for civil liberties, human rights, the need to preserve the Constitution in letter and in spirit. And that is the dilemma, this very difficult dilemma. And one easy to fail. It's constantly, constantly under debate and under review. So we analyze uh, the material in this book on these three levels constantly and see how difficult it's been and how challenging for all three actors and how they represent a larger, if you would say, paradigm that's in play in the world today. Ahmed, since you were kind enough to stand there during this, do you want to ask a question now? Oh, no. Okay. Well, thank you. you. you can <laughs> head back to your seat. Don't put it that way. Don't put it that way. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, not me. Let me, I want to go back to the, uh, Musharraf's dilemma, uh, the, this notion of the periphery and the center. Uh, isn't that ultimately the challenge of any society? It is, uh, except if the president is going to tilt so heavily towards the center, John, and begin to ignore the periphery, you are then tilting away from a balance. You're not finding a balance. So while it is the imperative of every society, not every national leader achieves that balance. How, if you look at Pakistan today, mm -hmm. uh, describe to us how that attention to that balance, better, a more balanced approach, how that would change current policy? A lot. Uh, if you take Pakistan today, there are major problems within Pakistan between the central government and the tribal areas of Pakistan. Uh, you see the suicide bombers, the crisis in these tribal areas. You have something like 100, 150,000 soldiers, Pakistani soldiers in the tribal areas. There are problems in Balochistan where Baloch are being killed mysteriously. They're found dead. The next day, Baloch are killing settlers, very often Punjabi settlers. It's not a happy situation at all for any nation to have. And John, the tragedy is, who is killing who? It's Muslim killing Muslim. And the tragedy again is the world we live in, the world of suspicion, disinformation, uh, dissimulation, that uh, pe people will say in Pakistan, there are conspiracy theories floating around that, well, all this is being done by Americans or Israelis or Indians. That's what they'll say. 
So they need to be looking at their own society and saying, look, this is our problem. It's always easier to blame someone yeah, else. Yeah, you blame, external blame someone external. The, the problem is internal. It needs to be resolved internally. The, the one contradiction here, perhaps, is uh, globalization seems to have exacerbated these mm -hmm. tensions between these traditional cultures and these modernity or the center and the periphery, mm -hmm. where it seems like it, it could go in the other direction as well, that there are opportunities to communicate and to understand each other uh, that are greater now than ever before. Absolutely. You again picked up a very important point in the book that globalization should, in fact, be having a very positive impact, especially on the periphery. Information, access to industries, multi-corporation, jobs and so on. But in fact, again, if you see it through this paradigm, the central government monopolizes the benefits of globalization. All the big deals go through the center. And very often, the resources are out in the periphery. And you can look at this throughout, throughout the world, not just the Muslim world. So if the resources are in the periphery, the central government very often brutalizes the periphery by moving in their own settlers, converting the demographic balance of the periphery, and denying the periphery virtually even a daily subsistence uh, wage. The result is that a poor area becomes even more poor. And the central government, of course, ben benefits from globalization. You have all the technology and all the industries and, and some very rich, very, very rich people. You're seeing the global jet set as it were emerging from globalization all based in the central uh, parts of these societies. The distribution of the wealth problem. Yeah. You know, <coughs> help me, uh, this might be a difficult question to answer or, or impossible perhaps, but the, the sad dilemma you describe there, the, the haves, the have-nots mm -hmm. essentially, uh, doesn't always result in terrorism. What is the tipping point? What is the thing? What is the tradition? What is the, the X factor that creates terrorists in response to, to this in some cases, but not in others? You know, John, this is a question that I've had to tackle with in a very practical way. I've been in charge of law and order in Balochistan in the frontier province, and it was a matter of life and death to be able to answer that question. It's not a question of poverty. I have found uh, meeting these very ordinary people with not much money, so they would be seen as poor people from outside. These people had a lot of dignity, a lot of honor. Uh, they treated their guests with hospitality. Uh, they treated you as an equal. They didn't have any of this sense of hierarchy. And I had great respect for them. What converts them or people from their families or their communities into acts of violence, and these acts are coming from a lot of these tribal societies, really is a breakdown in their lives when they feel their sister has been raped, their mother has been raped, their father has been tortured and sodomized, where there's absolutely no hope for them. And it doesn't matter at all. Neither Islam nor tribal code is going to hold them back. When you have a breakdown on that level, what you then see is a mutation. You see a mu mutation of the Islamic code, a mutation of the tribal code. And that's when you have acts of suicide. Hopelessness, not hopelessness, necessarily poverty. Hopelessness, hopelessness and anger and fury mm -hmm. all mixed together. You see, John, suicide is the final act of desperation. One of these youngsters in front of us, you know, these are people about the same age as a lot of these suicide bombers. Just think of it. Why should those people be blowing themselves up and these kids living in America, traveling around, sitting here in Washington, benefiting from our conversation, meeting us here? Joke. Cheer up, for <laughs> God's sake. <laughs> The, uh, the, before we turn to your questions, which we'll do momentarily, I want to ask you about your conclusions. Uh, how to stop, how to win the war on terror, and you use the phrase stopping a thousand genocides. Yes, yes. Explain that, please. I'm finding when I looked at these case studies that literally today you have hundreds of acts of genocide. Genocide is the act of wiping out an entire race. The worst genocide, the, uh, the most horrible genocide in history, as we know, is in the 19. 30s and 40s, the Holocaust in, in Europe, the dreadful event. But there are other acts which are defined by the United Nations as acts of cultural genocide, linguistic genocide, and physical genocide. Now, if you use that definition, you will see that there are hundreds of genocides taking place on tribal communities right now as we speak. And how do we stop these? The challenge you are going to face. You have to be stopping them because if the source of the problem is the tribe and the tribal code, then the solution also lies in the tribe and the tribal code. Go back and look at that. Look at that in detail. The tribe has a notion of living 
within a code of behavior, respect for elders, respect for the neighbor, respect for the poor, and that is what has to be built up. It's going to be long term, it's going to take a lot of patience, and above all, it's going to take knowledge. That's the first word, and US students must pursue knowledge. Nothing better than starting to read this book, that's your first step, <laughs> so take that step. Do, do you see, Akbar, do you see any leaders who you feel are sympathetic to the worldview you just expressed? You know, John, I thought <clears throat> I was like, you know, a lot of these scholars in the wilderness, me and my little brave band of scholars w w with me. But in fact, as I began to discuss ideas from this book, I found a remarkable, remarkable resonance, remarkable sympathy, a whole range, whether they're Indians or Chinese or, or Ethiopians. We got the, His Imperial Highness, the, the, the Crown Prince of Ethiopia, giving us a terrific blurb. So we were getting this response because every country has a problem between the center and the periphery, mm -hmm. and they need to, to resolve it, to find solution for it. The solution is not to wipe out the other side. That has never worked in history. That creates violence and more violence. And I think that's where I see the hope. And if this generation becomes aware and involved and can then participate, I see hope. We are ready to, to hear your questions and comments. So I'm hoping we give you lots to think about. I see people, people raising hands. The process is you need to move over to that side and get in line over there if you have a question to ask. And Tim will direct you. Don't, uh, Tim, do what you need to do. Yes, ma'am, you're first. Go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my Assalam name is Fatma Noor, and I am from Peshawar, Pakistan. And I am placed in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. So as you mentioned about drone attacks and the tribal areas, so I'm actually from KPK, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and I'm really familiar with those places, and I, I understand what's going on over there. And then I have friends, a lot of friends from Waziristan. They tell me their stories, what's going on over there, and it's just, it's, it's really tension. It's like just stressful. What is your name? Fatma. Fatma. Yeah. Fatma, please share some of those stories because you are in a very privileged position because very few people here even know the stories from yeah. the And Fatma, I'm gonna ask you to take your hand off the microphone just yeah. because that can cause some, Matt, can you help out here and yeah. position this? Fatma needs the, the mic stand <coughs> lowered a bit. Okay. Or you can hold it like that, that'll work All too. Right. Sure. Okay, so I have a friend in my class uh, classroom. She is like, you know, my childhood friend and she's from Waziristan. And she told me her story. Is she a Wazir or a Masood? She's Masood. Mm -hmm. And she told me her story about her family who lives in Waziristan. She basically lives in Peshawar. So she told me that one day they had a drone attack at night and her uncles and cousins were outside. And on the same day, her two uncles who were 40 and 42 years old, her three cousins who were 26, 27, 28 years old, and her niece who were 16 and 17 years old just died in one drone attack. So which was just like really stressful. The whole, you know, whole school was really feeling sorry for her. So. Um, well, um, yeah, that's it. And yeah, they, she told me, and then she always tell she always tells me about what's going on every day there. She always tell me we just got a drone attack over there, and then army did this thing, and um, drone attacks happen. So it, it's just really stressful, and we don't like it at all. So my question is for you: that how do you see the relationship between Pakistan and USA? Uh, like s focusing the drone attacks because we are exchange students and we are here for public diplomacy. So how do you see the Pakistani people and American people focusing the drone attacks? Well, Fatma, that's a great question and I'm grateful that you have talked about the drone, especially in Waziristan. It's an area of the world which is not really known in the United States and yet there's such a discussion and interest uh, in that area. The drone debate has just started. And I really wish that uh, people at CNN and Fox and so on are seeing this program and they pick you up and interview you and talk to you about, about Waziristan so you can explain it in, in more detail because I think the debate here, and you must understand this is very clear, that America has to be kept, in safe, kept safe. So we are fighting them there so we don't fight them here. Somehow there's this notion and therefore kill the bad guys and only the bad guys are being killed. Uh, there are statements that only bad guys are killed, not civilians. Now, we know that's not correct, mm -hmm. but people don't know it here in, in the United States. So I'm hoping that this book will also generate some serious debate about uh, what's going on. Now, I will say this, Fatma. I will say this, and I've said this in the book, and you need to acknowledge this, that it is the leaders of Pakistan who've been complicit, mm -hmm. that the leaders of Pakistan are quoted in this book in the WikiLeaks, in which they've said to the Americans, 
that we will go to the parliament and say uh, to parliament that we reject the drones. This terrible thing that's happening. But privately, you carry on. So when you give this mixed signal, the United States is going to pursue its own policy. Ultimately, this is not a problem of the United States. It's a problem of Pakistan. Pakistan has to maintain law and order in its own territory. It cannot blame others. And it has to resolve this issue before the state itself is shaken to a point where it becomes very difficult to carry on normally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, citizens like you are in distress because you come abroad and you're not sure what's happening to your family and friends back home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. And here's huh. our next contestant on American Idol. Go ahead, please. <laughs> An honor. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Meleko Riemi. I'm from Tunisia, North Africa. Um, now that I'm closer, you do have great hair, sir. It's um, very kind of you. I'm sure you do underneath your <laughs> traditional <laughs> dress. <too. laughs> so um, a reason, one of the reasons we're here this year is to um, change perspectives, change wrong perspectives about our cultures and especially our religions. Um, I noticed change your own perspectives or change no, the change perspectives of others? Others' perspectives. Do you, does yours change a little along the way as well? well? Yeah, quite quite a bit. Oh. Yeah. So um, I noticed that it's it was quite common among teens to relate Islam to terrorism when I talk about my religion, and it is quite sad because I try my best to change that wrong perspective. Where are you attending high school? Uh, Solon High School, Ohio. Ohio. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask, what is your advice for us to be able to change these um, wrong perspectives when it comes to teens? I'm sure that your great book is like one way to do so, but teenagers, like they're not going <laughs> to read such a great book. <laughs> so you have a pamphlet version, <laughs> a YouTube version. Perhaps. Yeah. So what is your advice for us to be able to change uh, these wrong perspectives? My advice to you, and I have daughters your age, my students are your age is not to underestimate the intelligence of teenagers. If you give them that information, if you give them that knowledge, they will pick it up. So keep talking to them, continue talking to them, tell them what your culture is, tell them what your Islam is, and they will appreciate it and they'll become partners in this dialogue. Now tell me, you tell me, what were the great challenges that you met in the United States and what inspired you the most? Um, well, I was really inspired by um, the fact that Americans have really big hearts, like they are so good to people. And I personally, I didn't have any like um, problems when it comes to like my look and my religion, which I'm like so grateful to that. So yeah, the fact that Americans are really open-minded and very generous people. Exactly, exactly. That is that is a great thing. Yeah. Well, and thank you for starting that revolution. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mohammed Abu Nasser, an exchange student from Jordan, and currently from from Jordan, Jordan, and currently in uh, the school of Anderson Shiro in Anderson, Texas. My question is uh, about the international community. Coming from the Middle East, we always hear about the international community trying to help an Arabic an Arabic country in the Middle East get over a, a dictator or a conflict, and it like what happened uh, in Libya, what happened in Iraq all the international community is trying to help. Some people might not want the international community to help in our countries because they want to keep things domestic and they don't want to uh, get interacted with the other world, especially when it comes to choosing a leader or taking care of, uh, you could say, their own lives. So is that what's happening in those areas or is the is it that the international community not doing much for those people? Can I, can I ask you a question before uh, Akbar responds sure. to yours? Uh, th is your rule or your notion that these are internal problems that mm. should be solved eternal, uh, internally, is that a blanket statement or do you think there are cases where external players should get involved? And I'm thinking of Syria right now because that's a debate going on in this country and around the world of whether the international community should do more. For me, I think that in Syria now, things got, have gotten out of hand and it's been going for a really long time. So I think it's time for somebody else to take charge. So there are circumstances where you would accept. Of course, there's some players. times when you have to ask for help and mm -hmm. okay. and Libya, list. Libya. In Libya, I think what happened was Under really Gaddafi. good. Yes, I think what happened was really good that 
the international community took care of it and they helped the they helped the people get get over that dictator and start a new life some people think that they would have other interests that are hidden after before that but as far as i know they helped the country get over a bad dictator and now they're trying to open a new page and get a new country and new democracy okay. well again um we need to remember that we are living in the age of globalization. Globalization by definition means that no country is isolated, especially the younger generation. You guys are in touch with the whole world constantly. All the time. All the time with all kinds of things. Which means that if there is a problem in any part of the world, Middle East, Far East, South Asia, it's not going to be contained. Therefore, in a sense, so much knowledge, so much transparency, is good for democracy. It's very difficult for a dictator or for tyranny to triumph when there's so much knowledge, when there's so much light. So I would say that this is a time when ordinary people in these countries can benefit from these developments. And remember that the international community may have some, some of its own agendas and reasons to interfere, but overall people do want to have a world where there's peace and there's stability and people prosper and they can trade with each other and are able to live together as a com committee of nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, you next. <laughs> you didn't applaud for all of my questions. You, you applaud. <laughs> when your peers ask a question, they get applause. Okay, okay. assalamu alaikum. No. My name is Arlene K. Hambali, exchange student from the Philippines, currently staying in Maryland. So my question is because in my situation in my whole school I could I could still see that there's still discrimination between Muslim and Christian and then I could also say that it's also happening in the Philippines because in the Philippines it's just like 90% 90% were Christians or other religion, religion like Jewish and 10% were just like Muslim so my question is how do you react about the stereotypes that Muslim are terrorists and then being as an ambassador what did you do to stop it let me just say, ask a question of the group. Now, you're the second student to yeah. bring up this notion of equating Muslim with terrorist. Yeah. Let me, if, if you've encountered that as well during your time here in the U.S., raise your hand. So a lot of people, yeah. That's a, a, almost half, a, a third yeah. to, a, to half. Yeah. Now, you're all Muslims, you put up their hands, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. But you came across this. Yeah. Okay. You okay. came across this notion that Muslims are equated to terrorists. Especially like little ch children and then when they saw me like because I'm wearing hijab and then they said oh you're Muslim and then sometimes they don't like talk to me but I really try my best to socialize with them and then at the end they like talk to me and it's like oh okay you're good and then it's like These are life changing yeah. experiences Yeah for so so my question is what how what did you do to stop about it? Well because uh, not everybody can meet face to face Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well it's a, it's a great question and I think um, you yourself have answered it. Uh, you answered it with a smile. You have a beautiful smile. And you answered it with friendliness. That's part of it. And to remember that many of these people asking the question genuinely want to know because they've never met a Muslim before. A lot of the time they've only heard about Islam from the media. So it's important that all you, especially the students, both Muslim and non-Muslim, in order to create a better, more peaceful world, go out there and engage with this idea because this is a very recent notion and I think it'll pass. These are great movements in history that come and go and if you look at history, there have been other races, other religions that have been branded one or the other and they pass. What is important is that we all learn to respect each other, not just one religion or one race. Now when you do that and you reach out in that spirit, people will respond in exactly that same spirit. You can ask one more question. No, you're over the limit. Go. Or <laughs> no, go, go right ahead. Okay, right okay ahead. There, because there's also like an issue. For in that my smile of yours, one more question. <laughs> okay, one more question. There's one of my friend in my gym class. He asked me about the word jihad, and then I told about him that jihad means it's like struggling. Jihad like is struggling. It's not just about holy war. It's just about it's struggling with your homework in order to in order to have a better life. And then he told me that his teacher told them that jihad means holy war. So what do you think about it? You tell him that his teacher has been trumped by a professor. That's me. And <laughs> this is this is the answer. Tell him that and tell his teacher to correct his information. 
The Prophet was asked to define jihad and in Islam the source is the Prophet of Islam. That's the ultimate authority. I can't go beyond that, you can't go beyond that, your friend's teacher cannot go beyond that. And he defined, the Prophet defined jihad as divided into two categories. The greater Kabir and the smaller. The greater jihad and the smaller jihad. The greater jihad is exactly what you've said. To improve yourself spiritually. Elevate yourself through prayers, through acts of compassion, through acts of study. The lesser jihad is when you must defend yourself. A Muslim is ordered to defend himself if you are attacked. If you are attacked, your wife is attacked, your family is attacked, you must defend them. Because unlike Christianity, Christians have been told if someone slaps you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. Muslims must defend themselves. So that is the definition of jihad. Now in the popular, in the media, people pick this up and say jihad means holy war, holy war terrorism. That's all propaganda. And these, again, these are movements in history, I ideologies, Is it ideas. propaganda or can it mean that too? It cannot mean that, okay. uh, John, because you see, holy war would mean an act of aggression. Mm -hmm. Jihad is defined. And remember, John, I'm not just speaking as a scholar off the cuff. These the books have been written, scholarly tomes have been written on this. Um, very early on Islam, the great scholars, the great rulers of Islam actually defined these things. So you cannot now start redefining uh, Unfortunately, them. jihad would not be the first word corrupted by common yes, usage. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the experience that you're having on this program, I hope you understand, and you probably do how remarkable it is, because you, your question reminds me of, we all live in bubbles of a sort. Some of us live in larger bubbles. And, you know, whether uh, someone has never met a Muslim or never been inside a mosque, well, you could find Muslims who've never been inside a church or, yes. a, or a synagogue. It runs in all directions. I can remember my Irish Catholic grandmother who had quiet, friendly rivalries with her Protestant neighbors mm -hmm. because there was even fellow Christians had uh, rivalries or suspicions among themselves. Mm -hmm. So it suggests to me there's an onus on all of us to get outside yeah, your yeah, bubble yeah, yeah, yeah. and to do what you're doing, meet face to face yeah, with yeah, other yeah. people. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Whether you know it or not, you are citizen ambassador or, or student ambassadors now. Yes, you have been anointed, so please be that. Mm -hmm. sure. Student ambassadors. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Bashir from Egypt. Ambassador and Bashir, as we just <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm placed in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. And I go to Oak Park High School. And for being ambassador for my country, Egypt, which I adore and respect, and for being not Christian, uh, not Muslim, I'm sorry. And uh, like at school, you know that some of the Americans know that Muslims are only tourists and stuff. And for being like hearing about what's going on in Egypt and pumping churches and stuff. So that's what makes them like asking all the time. So are the Muslims in Egypt just killing you? Blah, 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 blah. So like what's my responsibility as I'm not a Muslim, like as an, I'm Christian and how can I present Muslims as well. Do you as feel a do you feel any responsibility? I do. Because I'm to not to help fix a misunderstanding? Yeah, because I'm not ambassador for only the Christians here. I came here as ambassador for all the Egyptian. So not Well for done. I think you are the true ambassador. Because I met your archbishop, uh, the Copt archbishop in uh, Lambeth Palace in England. Lambeth Palace is the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. And we had a great gathering of Christian Muslim leaders recently, a few months ago. And he was the head of the Copt Church yeah. in the UK. And he was also very concerned about mm -hmm. the dialogue. And you're right because you see when intolerance becomes pervasive, everyone is affected. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. After 9-11, Sikhs, Sikhs in the United States have been attacked, unfortunately. They have been, their temple has been attacked. Recently, there was an event where Sikhs were killed in the temple. And they have nothing to do with 9-11 or even being Muslim. Mm -hmm. But because they have a beard and a turban, some people thought that they're also Muslim and therefore they attacked them. Recently, a woman in New York pushed a man and she pushed him into the uh, subway and he died. And she said then, she gave a statement saying, I hate all Hindus and Muslims. The Hindus had nothing to do with 9-11. And suddenly, you're now taking in entire races. 
So where is this going to stop? So I'm really glad and I congratulate you that you're so sensitive to your own country that you're representing all of Egypt, not just the Muslims. So big hand for you. Thank you. I'm so honored to meet somebody like you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next. Any fans of Spider-Man in the room? <laughs> well, the, the lesson of Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> you have great power now. You have a unique experience, unlike most people on the planet. Um, hello, I'm Nemanjev, an ASML exchange student from Serbia, and I'm placed in Brainerd, Minnesota. And I just wanted to say, like, um, for this workshop this week here in D.C., um, I didn't have a lot of contact with um, YES students. So for me, this was a wonderful experience. Um, it was really interesting and fun to see all the different cultures and the traditions and to be introduced with the issues that, hap that are going on in um, those countries. Could you give us an example of one thing that you either thought before and found out wasn't true or a new thing you've learned? Um, like from the media, um, the only thing I know is that there are a lot of wars going on there and only the bad things that happen. And that's what I really don't like about media is that everything is being portrayed as bad and killing. I know that those things happen, but still it's, um, there, the media does not present the other side of the world and it's really wonderful to see. The news well, generally reports when things go wrong. They don't yeah. tell you about when things are working. Yeah, but still it kind of creates the image of that everything is bad mm -hmm. and that's completely not true because all these people here, um, they're my roommates, they're like people that I have breakfast, dinner, lunch with and they're all wonderful and I don't know, just, um, I have the issue with media's portraying um, different countries and regions bad, just like for our region. Um, if I talk to people around my school and I tell them I'm from Serbia, they always ask me about wars. And even though it happened, they're still the other side, the good side, and the friendships. And still here, well, we're here together with, like, the whole region is here together, and we talk to each other and everything. And um, I still, I don't know. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, that's good comment. Let me ask Akbar, can yeah, I ask you? Can, can I ask sure. one uh, young friend a question? Of course. Now, you know, you're uh, from Serbia, you're from the Balkans, where there's been a lot of tension between Muslims and non-Muslims. Here, you're meeting so many Muslims from different countries, Egypt, Indonesia, Jordan, Pakistan. Uh, how did you find this experience? Did it help you change your opinion about Muslims? Did things surprise you? Um, for me, it was really interesting um, because I really enjoyed it um, because it's not something you can s experience every day. And um, I can say, like, I kn the image I had about the wars, but I knew that there's a good side because I know that my country is being portrayed as bad and there's a good side in it too. So it kind of, like, um, gave me hope for my um, thinking that there is a good side to it too. And I know there are a lot of issues, but I know that they're being fixed or there are attempts for them to be fixed. So that's the thing that I really appreciate here in this workshop. Thanks. Well, thank you for uh, using the word hope. I think that's well, a great word. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. I want, to, I want to ask you, Akbar, I know that one, post 9-11, mm. one of your concerns was how Islam would be depicted in media. Yes, in yes. Ma what have you seen? Has, how has the progression gone? Has the situation improved? Again, uh, this is a very pertinent question because there's been a survey recently. The Berkeley Center at uh, Georgetown had an actual survey, spent several months, many, many students conducting it. And at the end of which they concluded that the gap that had existed after 9-11, and we assumed, and we worked very hard, John, people like you and me, to close that gap. In fact, that gap has widened even further. Hmm. So while a great amount of work has been done, a great am amount of work still needs to be done. So it's, it's the old treadmill. You have to just keep running, keep running, keep running, and pray that we run fast enough so that the events, the terrible events that are constantly happening in the world don't overwhelm us and completely finish uh, society around us. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm John, and uh, I'm from Kenya, and I live in California. I have two questions for you, sir. The first one is, 
what motivated you in writing such a good book? The second one is, what do you think, from your personal experience, what do you think of tribal war and what can be done to prevent these tribal wars? Thank you. Very good question. The first question, what motivated me was a feeling that, again, with my background, with my experience in tribal societies, I could comment and hopefully someone would benefit. Secondly, how we can find solutions is go back, you're from Kenya, go back to Jomo Kenyatta. When Kenyatta became president, read his speeches. He wanted to bring everyone into society. He wanted to bring the Somali population into society. He reached out to them. Today you're seeing the situation is not good. Actually, right now you're having a great trouble with Somali. Of course, and it's in the book. We have I think we have time we could get to one more question. Go ahead, please. Come on over here into the, the pool of light as you ask your question. Hello, my name is Lama. I'm from Palestine. And I will tell you that when I first came in my host school, when they asked me where I'm from, I say, look, I'm from Palestine. Some people, they don't even know where is that. And the people they know, they think that Palestine, most of it are like Muslims. And when I, when I, try, them, when I try to make them think there is like there's something called Pus and I say, well, I was born in Bethlehem City, if you know what's Bethlehem City. And they say, yeah, but you said you're Palestinian. How was you were born? How come you were born in Bethlehem? It's like, well, Bethlehem is in Palestine. So, so they think that like Palestine is just Muslims, but like there's lots of Christians too. And they also think that the, the Middle East is most of it, like all, all of it are Muslims. So what do you think America or like the United States can help like with the media to make people or to educate them about the Middle East in general. Thank you, Lama. Thank you for that and question. And I should tell you, we only about 30 seconds 30 for you seconds. to respond. To Lama, this. I have a student called Lama who's also doing what you're doing, is to inform, to educate, and through that, the Americans are great people for learning. They really want to understand. Jews, Christians, Muslims, all Americans. Reach out to them, inform them, and they will respond to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lama. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. I, I want to ask you uh, to, to join me in thanking Akbar Ahmed for joining us today and talking about his new book, The Thistle and the Drones. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Akbar, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you. Enjoy thank the rest you. of your time in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.